Um, but I'm delighted to uh, introduce our uh, third speaker for uh, this track, um, Sophie Routard. Uh, Sophie is uh, the API lead at uh, Euler Hermes, and uh, uh, she is always very generous with sharing uh, the organization's um, uh, strategies and changes that they are leading, uh, of which she's been uh, a large part of. And uh, today is going to talk to us about uh, uh, um, unpicking or digitizing a, a monolith, certainly um, a topic uh, um, I know that many people um, <laughs> feel very, very strongly and passionately about. So welcome, Sophie. Okay, thanks, Claire, for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here at the API Days in Helsinki. Um, unfortunately, I'm not in Helsinki. I'm actually in Berlin, um, hoping to be next year in Helsinki, really which would be a, a nice thing. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about um, saying bye-bye to the insurance monolith um, to share a bit our uh, IT transformation strategy at Euler Hermes. Um, before I start uh, with that, I will be quickly introducing our business model, the credit insurance, because I'm sure it's not known to everybody. It's, uh, it's sort of a special industry product. It is quite simple. So imagine there's two companies trading with each other. There's this left company selling goods to the right company. So they send ship with the goods um, and with an invoice, of course. And then uh, it will take, let's say, 60 to 90 days in average until the invoice should be paid. And then everybody's happy. Very simple. Now let's do that again. The ship is going again. The invoice is um, put with it again. And then it takes time. And it takes a little more time than usual. And you ask yourself, oh my God. Uh, unfortunately, right company went bankrupt before they were able to pay the invoice. And that can be uh, not just an embarrassment, but very dangerous also for left company because there's a lot of money that can be done. And that is actually uh, what we are insuring against this risk of um, trade loss. To do that, of course, we will do an assessment of right company before this trade is happening. And then we will tell our left company, yeah, you can do that trade or maybe better not to, to protect them accordingly. And then, of course, we would pay the invoice if things go wrong still. Um, of course, our left company typically is a, a little larger company. They don't have just one customer, luckily. They might have hundreds and thousands of customers. And then we are going to ensure those um, customer relationships individually. So you see there's a lot more communication involved than in a classic automobile or housing insurance cover. Um, now, uh, let's look at this at a more global level because there's thousands and thousands of companies doing trade with each other worldwide. And so there's millions of uh, relationships that can be insured and, and that, that can benefit of that insurance. And also there's other market players like platforms, um, brokers and such that can partner up with us to um, provide this kind of uh, security. And there you can imagine that this is uh, a use case that is very good to be insured by APIs because if you do all that manually, it's quite a hassle. So we're not a startup. Uh, we've been there for more than 100 years now. And by the way, we're part of the Alliance Group today, which is the second largest uh, insurance group, group worldwide. Um, so we have quite some experience. Um, the story did not start with APIs. It started with paper. That's pretty much how it looked like in the 20s when this company was founded. Um, of course, the company has always been investing um, in modernization. So yes, we did modernize over time. But only in the, let's say, 70s and 80s, that's where the IT journey actually started because that's where IBM invented the, the mainframe and where all the large uh, insurance companies started to invest heavily in this new technology. Um, so that's why this is roughly the date where I would situate that we created our monolith. 
and call it the birth of the monolith. So we have this nice and friendly monolith here um, in the 70s. It still is very friendly because it uh, allowed at the time then to do things that we could not do earlier. It's uh, allowed to automate things. And so, of course, the company puts pretty much all the business processes into that machine and um, over the years invested more and more. And this was working very nicely. Now, then came a time, roughly the 90s, where um, Allianz came and, and purchased a number of credit insurance companies worldwide and founded Euler Hermes from these. And this is also something very common with other large insurance group that they are founded of several pieces that initially used to be independent. And what that is, it actually creates the multi monolith because each OE, each entity had its own system and they resemble each other in, in the way, in the, in the features and everything, but it's a lot of redundancy and technical differences. So we have the, the multi monolith now and they are still very friendly because they still do what they should do. They are still very performant and, and so on. However, came the internet, um, came online portals, came more and more the need to expose features directly to our customers. And now they are smiling a little less because actually it was already quite complex to connect one online platform to these different monolith technologies because they all have their own interfaces. They all have their variants in the business processes and everything. So it's actually been quite complex to, to build that. There was a solution to that, we thought, and technology thought. It was pretty much then when came up the SOA um, uh, trend, I would say, the enterprise service bus. And what that does is actually building a layer in front of those monoliths, uh, sort of a gate to control them. Um, that was a first try to, to cope with the situation. However, it did not change anything in the fact that there was still the monoliths and there was still the complexity that comes with them. And more and more time goes by. Well, actually our nice and friendly monoliths, they are not friendly at all anymore because uh, SOA couldn't handle really the problems that came with them. So we have now really an aging technology. We're here in the 2000s roughly where this COBOL technology and things like that, they become really difficult to handle. There's no stuff anymore on the market that is able to use those. Um, they still have these frequent downtimes that you have to do because if you want to deliver any code, well, you have to turn out the machine, deliver and turn it up again. And every time you have a, a service interruption. Uh, it's costly to, to maintain all these, especially as they are redundant. And finally, your time to market gets very poor. So we had to do something. And now, of course, we could have just replaced them by a new monolith. Um, probably it would have been an even more giant creature. Um, because if you have the, the different complexity in all the, the countries involved and you want to do this in just one machine, it's really, really difficult and it's super costly. So not a good solution at all. Instead, we decided that we have to slice down that complexity and Actually, we have to slice down our little monolith. So sorry for that. But we have to cut that complexity down, complexity down into pieces in order to be able to actually manage it. And this is what we did. And that's why our strategy is a microservices strategy, because the microservices, they are just very tiny little monoliths that we can control and um, that are much more flexible to, to live with. So we did that, we started that journey, and we found then, of course, that doing that, uh, you have this, this high number of applications that you create, the microservices. So you do need a different organizational model to control them. And this is where we uh, needed product owners for each monolith, definitely. 
And that's where we um, come to the Spotify model. Thank you, Spotify, because um, they did a lot of communication around this squad-oriented organization that we actually adopted, which is that you have small cross-functional teams that are in charge of each microservice, and they have mixed competencies. And that's very important. So typically, we have the product owner as one key resource. Um, the product owner will look after a product vision for the microservice, a real business strategy, business case study, and so on. Um, product owner will know for whom this microservice is actually intended um, and also make sure that the quality of service is right. And then you will have the technical counterpart we call the tech lead. Uh, who would really look after the technical components of the, the microservices, the design, performance, sustainability of the code, and the automated deployment and all that. And of course, you have other team members, uh, Scrum masters. You could have business analysts um, and DevOps teams, developers, to create the, the thing. What's essential here is that it makes IT and business work really close together. And that's one of the key success things that we, we see. Because in the earlier times with the monolith, you tended to have one huge business team and one huge IT team. And there was sort of a, a frontier between them. So the, the collaboration wasn't that easy. Now, having said that, this is great, um, but still, to be honest, it has some challenges that we have addressed. So for example, the first um, challenge that we found is that when you have these many microservices and many APIs, and you want to give that service to your customers and your partners, then you will want to give them a consistent experience. And that's not easy if you have really these multiple individual squads that are owning their service. So you can find different technologies already in the backend and for good reasons. So we would not want to force everybody to use the same technology. Uh, you can have different skill levels, uh, especially in the product owners, we found that. So you have people coming originally from IT, they, don't, they really know how to test their API and, and do every detail work how to de define a swagger and so on. Uh, you have others who don't have that knowledge. Um, some, are, uh, some are in between. So what we did, we um, created this API governance team, data governance team to work with them to ensure that consistency. And to do that, um, we actually created a design guide, which is uh, company wide and published on our internal confluence so everybody can access it anytime. And same goes for the API catalog that uh, allows to see which features are already available uh, to avoid also that they are being built redundantly. Uh, same goes for the data model. So if you name, name a company a company, then everybody should name it a company in a swagger and not a corporate or, uh, or whatever else. Um, so a lot of coaching is uh, what this team is doing, uh, especially to the POs, which is quite important also to get that consistency at that level. Uh, we contribute into design sprints, or sprints of the, the squads very early in the process before development begins. That gives the best quality, actually. Um, we also do a little policing uh, in the end of the process, so we have to validate the merger request in GitLab before our swag is validated and development can begin to avoid um, that we oversee issues. And also we um, maintain documentation and testing guidelines um, that are also linked to the fact that we need to ensure that quality. Second, um, we have these cloud-related aspects and it's pretty comparable to the design aspects in in that our microservices, they are hosted on AWS. So we use that technology that we had to learn to live with it. And so we have an expert team that um, is there to, to really understand that and really help the squads to apply that correctly. And there's um, security aspects that are super crucial here. Um, because if you're deploying in a zero trust environment, uh, you need to make sure that 
every API fits to that and, and applies the right principles in regarding to connecting to the IDP, the, the resource manager to control the authorities, um, the gateway, and so on, uh, in order to not open the door to uh, attackers. So security. Um, the automated deployment is also very, very standardized. They have the expertise also in regards to FinOps in, in terms of what we actually have to pay. Uh, we, we need to be quite efficient in using those assets and also for the monitoring tools. Third, um, as I said, we're not a startup. Um, we're not just delivering pizza. We are in a very, very regulated environment because there's a lot of money being uh, handled in, in this product. So um, we have to cope with that in, uh, in all our developments. It's, it's super important. So we have this common rule sets that apply. Um, documentation is not just fine, it is mandatory that, that we define the process that apply to our products. And we have to be able to, to show them to an auditor the same goes all for IT changes. So everything needs to be logged in a JIRA ticket or anything similar so that we are sure that we know at any time who did what and why. Uh, we have to respect the regulations like GDPR on, on personal data treatment. Um, we need to be able also to show on each transaction um, on each transaction um, end to end what has been processed. And finally, we need to test also these assets. We need to make sure they are all respected on all our APIs. Fourth, resilience and quality. It's uh, also one of my favorite things here um, because the more microservices you have on which depends your front end, the more quality becomes key. Because if your front end depends on five API calls at a time, if just one of them fails um, every 10 times or so, the, the customer experience will be terrible. And the same is the case for performance. If every um, call needs like 500 millis milliseconds to, to be processed, that adds up by five, and it's just not, not something that you want to give to your customers. So um, a lot of testing is necessary, automated testing to ensure your quality is always, always seamless. If you have issues and you will still have issues, uh, it's IT, you need to handle them correctly. And uh, you need to do a post-mortem every time to understand what went wrong and to avoid that it will repeat. Um, you need to foresee budget in your investments, in your developments for continuous improvement to avoid technical debt and all these things. Um, also in uh, ensuring the quality, yeah, and as I said, uh, code quality and performance, it's, it's very, very important here. Uh, you also should have a very clear versioning guidelines, which is more uh, a DX thing, because if you, handle over the, the APIs to your customers and you should not have every day a new major version with breaking changes. And so you should best avoid these things. Finally, um, planning and alignments. It's uh, also a big, big topic because if you have these various front ends, they all depend on the same APIs that are being built. And you have maybe issues in prioritizing your roadmap on each of these APIs. So uh, you need to make sure to be aligned with all those programs that are running. So we do quarterly uh, big room plannings where we get all the people together in one large room, virtually, of course, um, to align on the roadmap for this quarter to make sure that the overall roadmap or, or the individual roadmaps of the squads will fit to an overall roadmap, which is the strategic one for this company. So that was a very fast um, walk through through these five challenges. And then I also would like to emphasize on culture being one of the 
not challenges, but, but one of the uh, important things. And that's where we take the bye-bye to the monolith very seriously. Uh, what you see here is our headquarters in Germany, in a German entity in Hamburg. Um, it was actually built in the 70s, late 70s, at the same time as our friendly monolith, if you remember. 22 floors, huge building and everything. Well, last year, we just went out of that to this building. It has five floors. And uh, in the inside, we went from this model where everybody has his own closed office, maybe two people in one room. And we went to this, which is a very collaborative workspace, which really fosters interactions between people and teams. And this is really, for me, um, very, very similar to, to the technical aspects where with the microservices, you have much more collaboration that is necessary. We do the same in culture. And for me, this is a, a key uh, success factor for us. Um, of course, in, in the, the smaller building, uh, we don't have the same amount of desks. So not everybody can be there at the same time. Everybody needs to work at least one day per week in home office. And so that changed um, completely our workplace um, equipment. So the, the remote workplace technically has become a standard. And so is the case for the team process. Because if every time you make a meeting, you have somebody who is remote, then you know that every visualization and, and stuff needs to be on IT. You don't have a paper whiteboard anymore where you, you, you draw with a pencil. And that again allows much better global um, collaboration between teams on, on different sites. And that's very enriching, I find. And also it has a very nice side effect because actually it allows you to work pretty much from everywhere you are. So this is me in, on the French countryside on the backseat of my old classic car. Uh, working a full day with uh, just a laptop and an iPhone. That's all I need to be productive the same way as I'm sitting here. And of course, that was a benefit when uh, COVID came up. Um, but independently from that, we had this already and it's very useful. Yeah, and that's about it. Um, so just uh, what makes the success of our transformation program, it's bottom-up approach supported by the top management, which is really necessary. Um, a lot of emphasis on learning to get into these new technologies and process, a culture change, but last and not least, the best stuff. And that's what really makes us. We have very knowledgeable people that work with us here and that makes it work. So thank you for listening. I hope it was interesting. And maybe there's some questions from the audience. Thank you, Sophie. Um, that was absolutely great. I, I have a question. Are all of the cartoons your own drawings? <laughs> yes. I didn't have time to fetch pictures on Google, so I rapidly <laughs> draw them on paper. But you know what? I think they tell the story um, far more effectively than uh, a lot of um, you know, sophisticated <laughs> graphics. So uh, congratulations, because it. Uh, um, I, I, you know, as a as a description of um, you know how to justify and get behind microservices, I think that is a fantastic contribution to the architectural uh, um, uh, way of illustrating a story. Um, I'd, I'd love to get other people in the audience's views. Um, we actually hardly have time for questions because we're um, about to start uh, the panel and be joined um, by uh, XJ and um, uh, and Hannah. So. Are you okay if we go straight into into that?